Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes, this works great. All right, so I'm gonna start. First of all, um, I wanna say that my body does not look weird, I am pregnant, and when um, Generate asked me to speak, it was like nine months ago, and I had no idea that I would be standing up here seven months pregnant. Uh, so this is kind of a new experience for me, and it's kind of fun. Um, I am the creative director at Charity Water, and I wanna start my talk by asking you guys a question. Can you remember the last time that you were thirsty? Or the last time that you could not find um, a drink of clean water? Anyone can remember that? A few people? Great. I can't because um, I live in New York City and there is um, a clean drinking water source around every single corner. I open up my tap, uh, I go to the bathroom, there are water fountains, there are water bottles sold on every single corner. We, uh, we never have to think about the problem of clean water. Uh, the nature of the work that I do uh, is, is the complete opposite. There are 800 million people in the world who don't have access to clean and safe drinking water. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the issue that we're working on, and I promise this will be a talk about design, uh, and it will circle back to it uh, soon enough. <clears throat> like I said, there are 800 million people in the world right now who don't have access to clean and safe drinking water on the planet. That's, um, that's what we call a water crisis, and the people I'm talking about are living in mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. And um, these are the countries we refer to normally as developing countries. This is the kind of water people are drinking. This was a photograph we took in uh, Niger three weeks ago uh, in the Sahel Desert region, uh, which is kind of spans a very, a very large part of Africa, encompasses two countries we're working in, which are Mali and Niger. And people are drinking this water every single day and they're giving it to their kids. Uh, grueling work to actually collect water for mainly women and children. Uh, women and girls, young girls, are specifically um, affected because water is considered a woman's job in um, developing countries. Girls drop out of school very early, some of them at the age of 8 to 12. Uh, they stop going, uh, they stop completely dreaming about any, any aspect of a future and uh, join their mothers in taking care of the house. And uh, part of, a major part of taking care of, of the home is collecting water. This is a video that uh, we just shot. I just want to kind of show you guys what it's like to pour water. This is specifically in Niger a couple of a couple of weeks ago. We were there, and um, uh, first of all, the the rope that they're using right right here is made by uh, by hand by these women, and uh, these 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 uh, this community has figured out a really cool pulley system to pull up these large buckets of dirty water out of really deep open wells that have been built two to three hundred years ago. Um, the water is very dirty, but uh, at least it's in their village. Some women have to walk very far distances because they don't have this kind of open big hole in the ground. Uh, we've heard stories, we actually spoke to a woman who uh, a long time ago fell down a well while um, she was pulling water and the rope broke because it was uh, made by hand and uh, she almost died. She had her baby on her back and uh, she grabbed onto one of the uh, one of the wooden pieces and um, she was actually rescued but she was uh, never able to bear children again. And uh, this is this is actually a common story. We were like, are there, are there women like this that have been falling down wells? They were like, yeah, tons of us. Um, many, many women in this region this happens to. Uh, there's also a large part of the water crisis when you think about, so obviously drinking and ingesting dirty water is, is a major uh, health risk, and especially for kids under the age of five. Babies, um, their, their immune systems and their bodies are just unable to fight the bacteria in, in contaminated water, and um, that is why mothers are losing so many children uh, shortly after childbirth. Uh, usually babies get diarrhea, dehydration, and then they die. Uh, but a, another huge part of the water crisis that is, uh, that is less apparent is the time spent walking and the uh, energy expanded to actually go and collect water. It's incredible, um, incredible amounts of work and many, many hours every single day. I've heard um, stories from all over the world. and in, in Ethiopia, I heard a story about a girl who used to walk eight hours a day, four hours um, to the water source, and then four hours back. So walking is very, very common for, clean, for dirty water. Um, this is walking in Ethiopia, walking in Rwanda, walking in Malawi. 40 billion hours are spent collecting water in the continent of Africa in one year alone. 
and that is equivalent to the entire workforce of the country of France for one year. So huge potential being wasted. Uh, walking is also dangerous. My team is camping currently in a village in Uganda, and they are living with a family uh, where the two daughters of this family, uh, two girls, uh, two sisters, six, uh, 17 and 18, both were raped on their way to collect water. Uh, they, they were walking four hours a day, and they were attacked and raped, and they both got pregnant, and they have babies um, because of their, of their wandering far outside of their community because there was no clean water source within their village. So the water crisis is vast. There are many issues that are, uh, that are affected by clean water. Education, health, um, and, and prosperity is, is probably the biggest one. Uh, the amazing news is when you bring clean water into a community, it's fascinating how quickly things can change. Uh, the first thing that is affected for kids, especially and especially girls, is education. And um, you know, girls don't have to make these long treks to, to, to help their moms collect water. Instead, they can actually go to school. Uh, and classrooms can be filled with kids, and we've seen that. And especially when you build a water project at a school, that is incredibly transformative. We normally couple um, water projects with latrines whenever we work at schools and clinics because um, sanitation is incredibly important, and especially for kids, uh, the biggest issue for girls when uh, they're going to school and there's no private place to go to the bathroom is they either have to walk home. When they get their period, they have to stay home, and they usually fall behind and um, often drop out of school. So building a clean water project and latrines um, can, incre can increase education potential dramatically. Also, clean water provides jobs for people. This guy, his name is Paul. He lives in Malawi, and we met him last year, and he's adorable. He basically took it upon himself to start fixing water projects, fixing wells um, in surrounding communities where he lives. He's currently in charge of 100 wells, and he packs his tool bag every single morning, and he gets a call from a village chief saying, hey, my pump broke this morning, and you need, um, I need to replace a washer, or whatever the, the issue may be, and he grabs all of his tools, he goes into a community, and within a matter of hours, he's able to repair it. They pay him a little bit of money. That's how he earns his living. This is, his tools are incredibly simple. They're um, rope, some feathers for glue, and uh, some hammers and a little, um, uh, like a little saw. Uh, so this is a great job for Paul and many, many people like him. Uh, if there are clean water projects, uh, they're always going to be needing, needing some kind of repair and maintenance because an average water project is actually pumped something like 40 million times a year. Uh, there's constant wear and tear. And then these, uh, we actually empower local water committees in every single village. So uh, their, their, their job is to maintain the water project as well and make small repairs. They call in guys like Paul when there's a big job. But they're able to make little tiny um, um, tweaks. And they're also the, the people usually in charge of educating families and households about how to use clean water, mitigating any issues, and also collecting small um, fees from every family very affordable so that when something major breaks, a pump uh, needs to be replaced. This water committee has the funds to be able to do it. And often on water committees, this is the first chance women have to lead in their village. Um, so it does empower women, and we're, all, uh, we're, we're very strict about making sure that half, at least half of a water committee is always women. Uh, this is kind of the meta-meta uh, reason why we believe clean water is the solution to, to long-term poverty alleviation. United Nations Development Report says that every single dollar invested in improved water projects can yield up to $12 for the local economy. So uh, whenever we build a water project, that uh, if it costs $6,000, multiply that by 12, and that is how much it yields in time savings uh, for people in health uh, improvements. So when you're sick, you can't work, obviously. Um, if you're sick because you've got a parasite or your stomach hurts or your kids are sick, you've got to stay home, can't work. Uh, another reason why people also go in debt is because of the fee it takes to take a bus to a local clinic and then the, um, medicine, it, it co the, the medicine that costs money in order to um, treat a simple bacterial infection that you might have gotten from dirty water. All that stuff goes away, and um, people are able to work, be more productive. Women are uh, sometimes a simple, you know, the simplest things we hear is like women say, I finally have time to come home and lie down for half an hour. 
um, because they work so incredibly hard. Uh, the previous photos that I showed you from Mali and Niger, what I didn't, um, what you didn't see is that the, the heat that they're working and pulling that water in is 115 degrees, and it starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's incredible how, how tough their, their, their lives are. Uh, so even just providing a little bit of rest for women is, uh, it, it, it makes it all worth it for us. Okay, so they're simple. Here's what Charity Water does. We are, uh, we are seven years old. Actually, we're going to be 12 this September, so we're almost, I'm sorry, eight this September. We're almost eight years old. Uh, gosh, I can't believe that uh, it's been so long. And um, what we do is we fund clean water solutions, very simple clean water solutions in 22 countries around the world. Uh, developing countries, and um, we do that through local partners on the ground. We don't build the wells ourselves. We're actually a marketing engine here in the U.S. to raise money in a really gr grassroots way for water projects, and 100% of the money that we raise, we pass on to our local partners in these 22 countries. So we've got Ethiopians working in Ethiopia. Um, we've got Bangladeshis working in Bangladesh, Nepalis in Nepal, and um, they're the ones that are actually running these organizations and building water projects. The solutions that we fund are very simple because we work rurally. Uh, there are no, often there's no electricity, so people ask us about uh, sort of some of the innovative and interesting technologies that uh, I'm sure some of you have read about, like the life straw or these big fog um, collection filter things. And we say, you know, right now, so far, the simplest solutions are the best for us because of the, of the rural nature of where we work. Uh, so we fund everything from hand dug wells, drilled wells, Rainwater catchments, which, which are just big tanks with gutters on roofs of schools and clinics sometimes. Um, Gravity-fed systems are big. Uh, spring protections and biosand filters are, are also um, uh, something that we do. And this is just quickly how a well is built. Wells are our, our main kind of water project that we fund. Uh, and some people say, you know, why don't um, people in Africa make their own wells or drill their own wells? Well, first of all, it takes... a two trucks, a compressor, lots and lots of equipment, and a lot of expertise. Uh, imagine a village could never figure out how to, I mean, you and I could never figure out how to build a well right now. So um, some organization is needed and some obviously heavy machinery. But when that stuff is around, it's actually incredibly simple to watch. A drilling crew, a skilled uh, drilling crew of about you know, six to 12 people, a drilling rig, a compressor, um, come out, a hydrogeologist will identify the spot where water, where water most likely is underground, and um, there are underground aquifers pretty much um, all, all around uh, the earth, and some of them are very deep, some of them are shallow. There are many layers of them as well. Sometimes you can actually hit two or three aquifers at the same time when you're drilling and get a lot of water. Um, but they'll drill for two days, They'll install um, drill stem first, drill, then pull that out, put piping down to line the well, and then install a pump on the top, and water comes out a couple of days later, and people are drinking clean water. It's amazing to watch. Uh, we heard a woman in Ethiopia say to us, an 80-year-old woman who said, after I watched this process, I, st I started uncontrollably crying, and we said, why? Why are you so sad? She said, because I've been walking for 80 years, and you mean to tell me that there was clean water underneath my feet the entire time. Um, so it's incredibly uh, wonderful to watch this process. So this is our goal uh, as Charity Water. We, we started with a very ambitious goal. We want to give clean water to every single person on the planet. In this day and age, there's absolutely no reason this cannot happen. Um, it's not just going to be us. It's going to be a lot of other um, charities as well that have to kind of work in different, in different parts of the world. We have to tackle this together. But um, our mission is to bring clean water to every person on the planet. Our vision uh, here, and this is something we don't talk about externally as much, but our vision internally is to re reinvent charity for our generation. And what, it, what that looks like uh, is, is a couple of very important kind of key things that I will talk about, and that's where design plays a, a, a big major part, and that's where online and product and tech um, and technology for us um, plays a major part, is, is in reinventing the way charity is done in this country. And... Um, and around the world. But first I want to tell you quickly my story. This is how I got here. Um, I, how did I get here? I'm glad I put this in so that I don't forget how to tell this. I was an immigrant at nine years old. I came to, uh, I came to New York 
with my family from St. Petersburg, Russia. My dad was a total hippie. He's wearing a suit, but he would never um, wear a suit. Normally, this is a very strange photo. Um, he was a total hippie. He used to smuggle Beatles albums into the United States, or I'm sorry, into Russia from the United States um, during communism because you couldn't obtain some of those things um, in, um, in communist Russia. So he always wanted to leave, hated uh, living in the communist regime, but he uh, could, not, um, could not leave until 1992. When the Iron Curtain fell, he was able to get out, and that's what he did right away. He came to New York, um, and then shortly after, a year after, my mom and myself joined him, and my grandmother came as well. So we were um, first class uh, immigrants in, in, in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And um, my family kind of, as a very typical immigrant family would, uh, you can imagine saying, they said, you gotta, you know, I was, I was really going in the artist uh, route. I was um, experimenting with fine art. And my family was like, okay, you gotta go make some money because we did not bring you to this country so that you could be a broke, starving artist. And that's where design came into my life. I, I thought about, okay, how can I be creative and use creativity, which I, um, uh, and, and, and use art, which I'm interested in, but also be able to make money. And uh, School of Visual Arts was a school that I heard about, uh, and they had a program called Computer Art. So I was like, okay, you can do art on the computer. You can probably make money doing that because computers, engineering, money, I don't know. And um, <laughs> back then I joined the Computer Art program. Uh, it's so funny that that's what it was called. I don't know what it would be called nowadays, like graphic design or 3D animation or something. Uh, and shortly, so I uh, got basically all of my uh, technical skills that I needed at School of Visual Arts. I learned Photoshop, I learned Illustrator. Without, I think without a formal education, I probably would not have been able to figure this out on my own. I know there are some amazing people who uh, like start Photoshop at, at the age of 11 when they're in uh, elementary school, but it took an education for me to learn that stuff. But after junior year, I was like, I think I've learned everything that I need to know, and I've also taken out $60,000 in college loans, and I'm going to be broke for the rest of my life, uh, which is when an opportunity came along at a, a small creative boutique agency. Uh, I interned there for one summer after my junior year, and my boss there said, you don't need to go back to school. Just come and work for us full time, uh, which was a very convincing argument at the time because I was definitely terrified about the college loans that I was going to have forever. Uh, and I was, I think, underneath it all, really not interested in doing my senior year thesis. So I was like, great, quitting school. Um, my parents were not excited about that at all. My immigrant parents were like, you need a degree, you're never going to get a job. Um, I was like, no, mom, that's not how it works with design. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I dropped out of college after my junior year, went to work at an agency, and this was, um, I, I was, uh, the agency was at the time called Superfad, a very small boutique place. And, oh my gosh, it was amazing. It was the first, I was like glamorous. I was, for the first time, doing, getting paid to do what I just learned how to do on the computer and, and, and in design. It was incredibly um, uh, rewarding and fascinating. And um, I was a junior designer, so, I mean, I was ready to do anything. I remember my first project was cutting out um, mats in Photoshop for like a month um, of this computer to make it rotate of, of an IBM computer. We were working for, our client was IBM and the project was to make it rotate um, and instead of shooting it on video, for some strange reason, they took like a bajillion photos in sequence and I had to cut out every single one of them separately in a mat in Photoshop. Uh, but anyway, I was happy. I was so happy doing it because I was getting paid and it was um, in my line of work and eventually I did start taking on um, uh, more interesting client work, and we were, um, yeah, we were working with bigger agencies, um, with Saatchi and Saatchi and White and Kennedy and Ogilvy, um, the the kind of usual suspects. Uh, and my clients became Honda and American Express and Coke and Pepsi, and um, our team would work on concepts and pitch concepts, um, and it was all going really well, and it was it was really fun. I mean, going to, to, to these big agencies and meeting with creative teams was like my dream job. This was, um, you know, my friends were still graduating School of Visual Arts, and I could tell them, like, hey, today, this is this was what I did at work. It was fascinating. For two years, um, this was my life, and it was a pretty conventional career path. I uh, was pretty happy with it. And then 
around the two-year mark, uh, something started to shift in me, and I didn't know why, but I was feeling kind of um, useless. And it all kind of culminated around this project. I was working on um, Clinique, which is a, a line of facial cleansers, if uh, you don't know them. But, um, and I absolutely love the company, still totally use their products, but this was the worst two months of my life. The, um, the client wanted this animated bubble to move across the screen and highlight the products. Um, it was like a soap bubble. And this was my job, I owned the soap bubble. For two months, I had to do revision after revision on how the soap bubble moves through the screen and the different reflections in it and the hint of color in different reflections and the way that it animated and now it's too low and now it's too high and it's going too fast or no, it's going too slow. And I mean, literally for two months, I was, I was moving a bubble. And that to me was the straw that broke the camel's back. I said, I think there are people doing very important work in this world that are saving lives and I am definitely not doing that, um, but I want to be. And I watched, I remember watching a movie um, called The Constant Gardener with, uh, uh, with Ray Fiennes and just that for some reason came at the right time in my life where I was like, I wanna, I wanna do something that means more than um, just selling stuff to people. Um, I wanna save lives, I wanna help people have better lives. Uh, and then I kind of stumbled upon this quote which totally spoke to me, it's by David Berman and he says the same design that fuels mass overconsumption has the power to repair the world. And for me this was, this spoke to exactly what I was feeling. I thought, you know, I do love design and I love being creative, but I can't figure out a way how to reconcile that with the stuff I'm doing right now. Um, how can I use design? How can I actually use my skills to do um, things that I believe are, 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 are life-saving? At first, I didn't know, so what I just did, like any, anyone um, who, who's seeking meaning or, 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 or purpose would do, I started to volunteer. I worked at a soup kitchen, I went and volunteered for New York Cares, which is an inner city organization here in New York, and <clears throat> um, I was just kind of searching, and one day, I ran into my next door neighbor on the corner of my East Village um, block, and was telling him all of this stuff about kind of how I was feeling and, and um, I was still obviously working at the agency days and volunteering at night and he said to me, you know, I have a friend who just got back from living in Africa for two years. His name is Scott and he wants to start this thing called Charity Water uh, and he's having uh, an exhibition in Union Square Park this weekend, you should come. I was like, what water thing? And there's a water, what's a water crisis? There's people that don't have clean water in the world? I had absolutely no idea. It's like, what is this? This, is look, this looks really interesting. He's, they're using design, at least, or they're trying to kind of be creative about the way they tell the story of this cause. Um, what, what this actually was were, were big tanks that, had, um, that were filled with water from our local um, ponds and rivers around New York City. And the, um, what Scott was trying to say with this was if your taps ran dry today, you, where would, this is where you would be getting your water from. This is the water from the Hudson River. Here you go, take a look at it. This is the water from um, the Central Park Pond. This is where we would be going. And I found this photo actually like years later, but that's me on my first day ever getting to no charity water. Uh, so we first started, I mean, this was like weeks, but weeks after Scott got the name and trademarked the, the organization. So we were literally in, in, in the conception stage. And for about a year, we worked out of his living room on his couch and on his uh, kitchen table. And um, I began to come over nights and weekends after my day job to basically help with anything design related. I mean, we were doing the things that, you know, every, every startup company needs, like making business cards and um, creating little stickers and brochures. And I was so excited because I was really getting to be a part of something very small for the first time that felt like it was gonna be huge one day. Uh, and soon after, a couple of months after, after being involved with Charity Water, I decided that it's time for me to go to the field. I have to see what this work looks like on the ground. Um, I did a very embarrassing thing to earn the money to, um, to pay for my flight over to Africa, because like I said, I was completely broke. Um, it's not probably as embarrassing as you're imagining, but 
I'll tell you what it was. Um, have you ever watched MTV at uh, five in the morning and there are these commercials that um, come on and they're like, do you want to know your true love? Dial 888-46-whatever. Uh, I did one of those. It paid $5,000. I animated the whole thing myself in a week, and I had the money to pay for my flight, which was awesome. I was like, I don't care. you know. Um, it, it was kind of, um, I didn't tell anyone about this for like years, and then Scott was like, we had this conversation once, and it was hilarious. Um, I finally told him uh, how, I got, how I got myself to Africa. But nonetheless, I got myself there. There I was in Liberia for the very first time. And um, Liberia was, at the time, the poorest country in, in all of Africa. It had just gone through a very uh, brutal civil war. And um, there were still UN uh, troops occupying the main city. And we had we'd started going out rurally and uh, looking at uh, potential sites where we could start funding water projects. And I ended up seeing things like this. Um, moms and kids gathering water from <clears throat> ponds and from puddles. and um, this is actually later on when I went to Ethiopia, saw the same exact thing. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with communities, just hanging out with people and learning about their lifestyle and uh, how loving people are and how, how a sense of community um, can really be incredible. And it's, it's just something that's so different um, and so still present in many of these um, developing countries in Africa that we've, uh, I think, um, somewhat lost a little bit here in, 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 the, in the States. But um, the most important thing I got to see was the difference between clean and dirty water. It was just such a simple thing. I mean, you don't ever want to drink the water on the left. And of course, you know, the water on the right looks great. Um, it was provable. It was tangible. It was visual. You know, it wasn't like finding a cure for cancer, which seemed like such a hard um, problem to prove or, um, uh, you know, asking for donations for something like that. I would imagine it's so much harder than saying, if you give us 20 bucks, that can give a person clean water for 20 years, and uh, you can change their water from left to right. Uh, and got to see this kind of just everywhere. So I was totally pumped. This was my dream job. I wanted to do this forever. I quit my, my agency job and came on full time as um, first as just a designer for Charity Water. I was a second employee. And that's kind of a testament to Scott, who founded Charity Water, um, who's actually now my husband. Uh, that's totally a separate story. But um, he, he was so, he was so uh, intentional about how he wanted to reinvent charity using design that it showed because the first person he hired was a designer. Most charities, the first person they hire is a programs person, then a finance person, then 25 other people before they ever think about hiring their first designer. And Scott was, was, a, was kind of a marketer at, um, at the core of his nature. He was a nightclub promoter in New York City for 10 years. And that's, he has his own talk that is actually fascinating about how he changed his life and um, ended up doing this work, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So there are three things that I think make Charity Water different, and these are the three things that we started with to reinvent charity. First, we said um, people don't trust charities, and people probably think that some of the money is wasted. Um, so we want to never run into that issue. And so when people ask us how much of my money, of my donation, is going to go to build water projects, we wanted to be um, absolutely sure, and we wanted to say 100%. So we built our model to give 100% of every public donation straight to water projects. That meant paying for our salaries, for our rent, for our electricity bill completely separately from a private group of donors. And currently, um, s uh, seven and a half years in, we have a group of 100 donors who fund um, our salaries, our flights, absolutely everything operationally. And we continue to give 100% of the public's money to the field. Um, it costs now about uh, $9 million a year to run Charity Water. We have 65 employees and 1,000 employees around the world. And 100 people, this group, gives us that $9 million. We actually are currently um, raising about $35 million a year for water projects from the public. Uh, the second thing we said we wanted to do was prove where every single project goes. Um, because another concern that we felt people had with charity organizations was, I don't know where my money goes. So even if I trust that you are using my money well, I kind of can't see where it's going. Um, and charities don't show this to me. And for us, we said this was actually so simple. Every single well is located in a physical place. Not, it's not going anywhere. Um, and back in 2006 when we started Charity Water, GPS devices, you could go buy one at Best Buy for 100 bucks, and then you could take it to Africa, and you could 
click it at the side of the well and you could get a GPS coordinate and upload it to Google Maps, which is what we did and we've been doing that ever since. We put every single water project that we fund on our um, website on Google Maps and you can see the photo of it, <coughs> you can read the name of the community, you can see the GPS coordinates. So if you actually wanted to go visit it and you were wandering around somewhere in rural northern Ethiopia, you could grab a GPS coordinate and you could find it. Um, and the third thing we absolutely wanted to do was reinvent charity through using design and using great marketing. And um, we started doing stuff like this. I mean, in the beginning, we were like, how can we just be interesting about talking to people about the lack of clean water? Um, so we sort of did this, like, imagine if you didn't have clean water campaign and, um, you know, how would you cook your food? What would you drink? Uh, we also uh, did a little photo series and, and, and interesting things like this where we wanted to be provocative and say, imagine if your grandmother who lives on the Upper East Side had to drink dirty water like this woman in Ethiopia. We would never allow this. So why is it okay for her? Um, imagine if your kids who go to a fancy, expensive prep school have to carry a giant fuel container filled with dirty water uh, to school with them every morning uh, or instead of going to school. We would not allow this, but these girls in Ethiopia walk every single day and um, skip, skip class to help their mothers um, carry water. Imagine if our friends in their Brioni suits had to go to Central Park Pond in the middle of their lunch break to collect water. Um, these men in Uganda do, and they're around the same age. They're 30 years old. Um, and then this quote kind of sums it up for why design is so important to us. Nick Kristoff, who's a writer uh, for New York Times, says, Toothpaste is peddled with far more sophistication than all of the world's most life-saving causes. And I don't like the word peddled, but the essence here is that we have, I mean, you guys in this room here today, you know, and from the previous talks, we know that um, we're a bunch of very talented people in this industry, so vast and robust, and we have such amazing ideas about how to create compelling products and how to market them. But um, at the time, when we were starting Cherry Water, no one was really putting that talent to use for, for, for causes. And in fact, charities were, were actually like hostile to designers and thought designers were trivial um, and frivolous. So this was the, the, the issue we were seeing a lot back then was, you know, um, charities would say, well, actually, if we do anything fun with design or if we make our website look good, it's gonna, people are gonna take us less seriously. People are going to think that we are um, too sexy and glitzy and that our work is not important. And we just said, that's just completely crazy and backwards. We don't buy that. Um, but, you know, th this was the, these were websites of charities that we were seeing. I mean, there's just like clutter and lots of information and stuff you don't understand. And um, where do I look? And uh, we, we kind of were anti all of this. And... Um, Currently, I mean, still, even to this day, you know, that's that's probably where we express the most creativity is on our website um, uh, through our through our mobile uh, approach and kind of um, the simplicity um, of what of what we do and the and the way we raise money. And then, kind of just graphic design wise, we were always uh, aiming to inspire and to make things that look beautiful that are inspiring to us. Uh, so these are some of our little graphic design projects that we've done over the years. Uh, just redesigning some brand identities. And this is a welcome kit for um, the, the biggest donors of Charity Water. Just introducing them to um, our organization and to our staff. Uh, we design immersive experiences as well. Uh, we designed this past year uh, pretty much every element of our big fundraising gala, which is in the winter time in December. And uh, we started by um, really putting and pouring a lot of love and care into our invitations and um, got a lot of uh, great paper makers and printers to donate all of the stock uh, and be involved in that way. And our designers just had such a great um, time doing this work because they knew that it was eventually, you know, what sets us apart and what helps us to raise money for clean water. Took that same identity into the space um, and uh, did just kind of, kind of some cool um, experiential uh, things like this water walk where we had people at the party try out what it's like to carry two containers of, of water. And um, a company actually sponsored every single person that walked and donated money to Clean Water Project. This is kind of the big space. Uh, and so, you know, what we were really doing with design is we were designing a new kind of charity. 
uh, a charity that hopefully, eventually, other charities would want to emulate uh, through their use of design and say, design is not a key for charity. Design is actually amazing, and it's a great tool, design, creativity, innovation. Uh, in the last few years, those first three major buckets of things that we believe differentiated ourselves from other nonprofits um, grew into five buckets because we started to use technology. And uh, we also started to use social media very uh, aggressively to build a movement. Uh, to, we were the first charity that uh, had a million followers on Twitter. We were the first charity, I think, ever to use Instagram. And, um, and for us, that was, that was just kind of important that we were early adopters of technology. Um, so with technology specifically, what we've been working on is to democratize giving. Instead of um, saying charity is only for the wealthy, uh, we say, no, every single person can and should um, be giving to charity whatever that they can. And it should be fun for people to be part of transforming lives and uh, changing the world. So over the years, this is kind of our biggest, our biggest um, source of bread and butter in fundraising is a fundraising platform that we built from scratch called My Charity Water. And anyone can come on, um, on our site right now and click um, sign up and start a fundraising campaign. You can upload your picture, you can um, set a goal, and uh, you can write a little mission statement about why you want to raise money for clean water. It's very similar to Kickstarter uh, or CrowdRise. I don't know if you guys have heard of some of the other platforms. We built our own from, from scratch. And um, so far, we've, uh, we've had pretty good success with it. We've raised, it's, it has raised $33 million through about 150,000 people who have gone out and done fundraising campaigns like this one. This is Chris Barnett, who did a wheelie. Um, for he did he rode his bike on the back of his wheel. I think that's what wheelies are called. Um, for like hours and hours and hours and hours uh, over the course of a year, and raised five thousand two hundred dollars for a water project. And um, this is little Sadie, who every day for a month put out a little table in front of her house, and her mom and dad helped her, and she sold lemonade and raised eight thousand dollars for clean water. Um, I think she's somewhere in Kentucky. Uh, Lynn Foote is another woman who is just a mom of six kids, and she gave up her birthday, and she said, I don't need any more presents. I'm 49, and I don't want my family and friends to buy me socks or sweaters. I'm just going to give up my birthday and say, instead of gifts, donate to charity water for my birthday. And she raised $839. And then this guy, PewDiePie, um, is just, I threw him in here because he's so wacky and crazy. He's a YouTube sensation. He has the biggest following on YouTube of any channel, and he plays video games. And people just watch him on YouTube play video games, and he discusses them and talks about them and makes fun of them. And because of that, he has the most followed YouTube channel ever. I don't understand it, but it's awesome because he raised half a million dollars from his fans for Charity Water uh, last year, and we're actually taking him to Rwanda. And he's actually this like really nice Swedish guy but he is a total character, as you can see. Um, and there's about 150,000 other people like these four people that I'm showing you who are doing crazy, wacky things. People are riding their bikes across America. Someone um, did a shave or save my beard campaign last year, um, having people donate to both campaigns and whichever one had the most money. This guy, was our friend, actually was going to chop off his beard or keep his beard. Anyway. Um, that's kind of how we believe um, grassroots charity can be done, is, is through involving lots and lots of people um, to actually be passionate and to care and to do interesting and fun and exciting things that bring them joy, that bring their friends into the story, and also result in um, clean water projects for people and giving people um, this leg up of, um, of having access to clean water in their communities. Uh, so another kind of way we've been using technology is, is to innovate on the transparency part. So we said we, we really believe that um, people should know exactly where their money goes. And for our case, we want, we want to send 100% of every single donation to Water Projects. But um, one of the biggest transparency issues out there in the water sector is that wells break, and then oftentimes there's no one around to fix them and communities go back to the pond or the river to get their drinking water. So we said, that is not good enough. Um, that's a lot, the international community kind of always said to us, that's just how it is. I mean, you've got to use community building techniques, and you've got to um, create better communication between communities, 
And yes, people have cell phones nowadays in Africa, but um, still this wasn't happening. And water projects were being abandoned and, and actually still are. So we worked with Google two years ago to start, um, to start working on a remote sensor pilot. And that's what you see, this little white strip between, um, between the two parts, the top and the bottom part of the well. That's a sensor that can tell whether water is flowing through it um, in real time. And the minute water stops flowing, <clears throat> the sensor sends a signal up to a satellite, which alerts us in our office and alerts our partners in their offices. Hey, something's going wrong here. There's not been clean water coming out of this pump for a day or so. At which case, our partners can jump on motorbikes and go out there and fix the, the, the water project right away. Uh, so our goal is uh, for this, so Google gave us $5 million two years ago to basically um, invent this low cost sensor, which was incredibly hard. It had so many criteria. It had to be under $150 per sensor. It had to be waterproof. It had to work with no electricity. And it had to be vandal proof um, because people would probably just steal it in Africa somewhere uh, if, it was, if it looked like something you could actually sell for money. <laughs> So all those things were really, really hard. We worked with eight laboratories around the country for a year and a half. Finally got this prototype. And um, our goal by the end of this year, uh, or the beginning of 2012, is to have 4,000 sensors um, installed on our wells around the world. Uh, we have 11,000 wells. So we're going to retroactively start by installing, by outfitting about a third of them first with these sensors to start getting massive amounts of data in to see how our wells actually working. In some countries, we have 10% of our wells that are not working. In other countries, it's less. In other countries, it's more. So we're really going to start to visualize and be able to see on a mass scale what is actually going on in the field with our water projects. And then the biggest challenge after that is once you know a well is broken, how do you create a system of mechanics that can actually go out and um, repair these projects in a timely way? So we're working on building systems, uh, or we're working on building teams of local mechanics, and actually starting to create small business enterprises around um, clusters of water points. And this is Robert, who is working on the sensor. He's an amazing guy. He came out of the CIA and joined Charity Water two years ago to work on this project. He's been flying all around the world, and um, and uh, right now he's currently in China, manufacturing or supervising our manufacturing process of this of this sensor, uh, and working with Google on the um, the kind of interface and the technology behind it. But um, so back to creative, I wanted to just kind of give you guys a, a sense of the fact that. We may seem uh, like, a, like a big charity, but we have a pretty small creative team. And I say this, and I want to show you guys this, because uh, people always ask, like, you know, you guys do so much stuff, and you must invest so much of your money in, in creative uh, resources. And I say, well, our team's actually pretty small. This is all of them. Um, there's currently one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people, and we're looking to hire two more. But um, basically, I've just got two graphic designers, two UI designers, a video editor, um, a content strategist, and myself, and our community ambassador, and I'm looking for two hires. But this entire team is um, making tons of videos, making our entire website, designing our website, uh, creating every print piece of collateral that you just saw, and and a lot, a lot more. Um, we also have a heavy uh, uh, focus on engineering, so we've got about 11 engineers right now. Uh, half of them are working remotely from different countries but um, all working on our fundraising platform. And um, we've also got a head of product who's the kind of completes the triangle of engineering, product, and creative. And um, some of the principles that our creative team really lives by is we, we want to infuse opportunity and not a sense of guilt uh, into the charity space. People should feel like they're, um, they're giving out of a place of love. Uh, and that's why we, we love images like this, where they're bringing hope and, and, and uh, prosperity into, uh, into, into communities instead of showing the dirty water stuff, which I started with. This is what you'll see on our homepage of our website, not, not the, not the um, sad stuff most of the time. And you'll see the hope that people um, have and the dignity that we want to show in every single individual. And um, the, our field team is constantly out there shooting shooting photos, shooting video, and having so much fun doing it. Uh, and I'll just wrap up by saying that if you guys ever have thought of using your creative or engineering abilities, um, it's, it's the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. It's the most rewarding decision that I've ever made in my life uh, is to work for a cause and not to work for applause. Um, this is just kind of a big fun sign we have in our office. Um, and 
it looks like this. It's really fun. I think I have a lot more slides, but I'm just going to kind of, actually this is it, I'm going to wrap up and tell you guys our progress over um, the last seven years, and then I'm going to tell you how you can help if you are interested. Uh, basically, just top level, we've raised $150 million in the last uh, seven years for clean water projects, about 11,000 water projects across 20 countries. We have 70 staff, and uh, we have given, uh, we've been able to give with our amazing supporters uh, access to clean water for 4 million people around the world. And that means that last year alone in 2013, uh, almost, we were like three people shy of a million people in 2013, but uh, 2,700 people, because of Charity Water, got clean water every single day around the world. And that breaks down to 114 people every hour and um, almost two people every second uh, that we sleep, eat, drink, and uh, do whatever we do with our days. Uh, this is how you can help. Uh, one of the most simple ways if you guys are interested, is you can pledge to give up your next birthday. If you're like, I don't want any more presents for my next birthday, and I don't want to have a party, we could still have a party, actually, but you could still do this as well. Go on our site, start a page, and shoot an email out to all your friends. And um, basically, the simple thing, the simplest thing we ask people to do is just ask for your age in dollars. So if you're turning 27, um, chances are you could find 10 of your friends who have 27 bucks that can give to your birthday campaign. And 100% of their money will go to fund clean water projects, and they'll actually be able to see at the end of the completion stage, exactly where their money uh, went and, and we'll send them a GPS coordinate of, of the well that, um, that your birthday campaign helped fund. And with that, I'm going to close and thank you guys all for listening.